This week's topic is atmospheric moisture. In order to understand how moisture plays a role in the atmosphere, we're going to imagine the air as a sponge. Now the first question would be, how much water could the sponge hold? Well, if we keep adding water to the sponge, um, eventually it becomes saturated, and that's when it reaches its full capacity to hold water. The saturation point is also known as the dew point, or 100% relative humidity. When the air is saturated, water vapor condenses into liquid water, and this is the point when clouds form, when dew can form on grass and other substances, and also when rain forms. How can a sponge become saturated? Well, there's two ways. The first is you can add water to it. Absolute humidity is the term that describes how much water vapor is actually in the air. The other way the sponge could reach its saturation point is you could squeeze it, and that would mean that there would be less space for water in the sponge. Capacity refers to how much water the air could hold. We can understand how to squeeze a sponge, but how do you squeeze air? Well, an open sponge that you're not squeezing has lower density, lower pressure, and most importantly, it has a higher temperature. A squeezed sponge has a higher density, higher pressure, and most importantly, a lower temperature. So by changing the temperature, we can squeeze uh, the air. If the same amount of water is added to both sponges, both will have the same absolute humidity. But which sponge could hold more water, the one on the left that's open or the one on the right that's squeezed? Relative humidity is a comparison of air's absolute humidity to its capacity and that is expressed as a fraction as absolute humidity divided by capacity. Another way of saying that is how much water the air has divided by how much it could have. Uh, as a reminder, in math, uh, the bigger the denominator of a fraction, the smaller its total value. So one-half is actually a bigger value than one-fourth. Uh, if the same amount of water is added to both the open sponge and the squeezed sponge, the squeezed sponge will have a higher relative humidity uh, and it's closer to its dew point. This is because both sponges have the same absolute humidity, but the sponge on the left has a higher capacity than the sponge on the right. Okay, I understand how you could figure out how much water a sponge could hold, but how does this translate to the air? Well, remember that temperature and humidity are closely related. You can determine the relative humidity of the air by comparing the temperature of normal air to the temperature of wet air. And you do this by having one thermometer that's just normally measuring the temperature and another that has a wet cloth wrapped around the end. That's referred to as the wet bulb. A sling psychrometer is just a device that has two thermometers. One thermometer is a normal thermometer, and the other is wrapped in a wet cloth. Uh, using page 12 of your reference table, uh, on the left-hand side, there's the dry bulb temperature. That's the normal air temperature. And on the top, you have the difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb temperatures. Now, notice if there is no difference, the relative humidity is 100%. Now, normally you'll measure one temperature uh, of the dry bulb, and that, let's say in this example, it's 20 degrees Celsius, and the wet bulb is always going to be a little bit cooler, and that, in this case, is 15 degrees Celsius. So the difference between the two is 5 degrees Celsius. You would find 20 degrees on the dry bulb and 5 degrees on the difference between the two, and that would give you a relative humidity of 58%. Uh, the same method works for finding the dew point. So you find the exact same location on the dew point chart, and that is 12 degrees Celsius for the dew point. As you increase the temperature of the air, you tend to decrease its density, and you also tend to decrease its relative humidity. And again, that's because as you decrease the density, you increase the capacity. This means that cool, high-density air tends to have a higher relative humidity than warm, low-density air. And the surfaces of the Earth, which have uh, different amounts of heat that they radiate, um, will change the relative humidity of the air above them. As air increases in altitude, it decreases in temperature. This means that it also increases in relative humidity until it reaches 100%, which is the dew point. Clouds form where the temperature of the air cools to the dew point. And you can see in this, as the air rises, uh, the temperature is getting closer and closer to the dew point. And when the dew point and the temperature are the same, that's when you have clouds form. Types of clouds are classified uh, primarily by the altitude at which they typically form. 
to make rain, you need two things. You need condensation nuclei, and you need to have air cooled to its dew point. Now, condensation nuclei is just a fancy word for a piece of dust floating around in the air. Now, uh, you can see in this diagram that little black spot is a, the size of a condensation nuclei compared to a raindrop, which is on the left. To cool air down, one of the main ways you can do that is to increase its altitude. Remember, as you increase altitude, temperature decreases. So what typically happens is air moving over a mountain cools down to its dew point, and it rains on what's called the windward side of the mountain, which is the left side on this diagram. As air decreases in altitude, it increases in temperature, which means that it also decreases in uh, relative humidity. So it's further away from the dew point. So as it comes back down the other side, we have uh, drier, uh, warmer air, and a rain shadow forms on the leeward side of the mountain. Now an air mass doesn't have to go over a mountain in order to change its altitude. If a warmer air mass uh, meets a colder air mass, that's called a front, and the warmer air mass rises over the cold air mass in the same way that air rose over the mountain in the previous example. Now if that cold air mass and that warm air mass are moving in opposite direction, it is called a cold front. And that results in ha fast, heavy rain uh, and thunderstorms, often violent weather. Uh, a warm front is um, when the warm air mass and the cold air mass are moving in the same direction. So that results in a slow, drizzly precipitation that can last for several days. We have some weather map symbols on page 13 of your reference table for uh, cold fronts, warm fronts, stationary fronts, and occluded fronts. Of those two, the most important are the warm front and cold front symbols. Almost all types of precipitation, including rain, drizzle, snow, sleet, freezing rain, and hail, form in the same basic way, which is that uh, air is cooled to its dew point. Um, you don't have to m uh, memorize all the little factors that change one type of precipitation to the next, but it is important to recognize that each one has a different symbol on the present weather key on the reference table. <laughs>